Podcasting is a great way to turn your passions into profit. In this episode, you'll learn from a leading VC who's invested in over 100 startups how to build your podcast and set it up for monetization. Welcome to the Podcasting Secrets Show, where successful creators share their best stories, secrets, and strategies. I'm your host, Nathan Gwilliam. Hello, incurable creators. Today, I am joined by Andrew Romans. He's a general partner of 7BC Venture Capital. He's also the host of Fireside with a VC. Andrew has founded two Silicon Valley and New York City venture capital funds. He's completed more than 100 VC investments into high-growth startups. He's achieved top decile. That means he's in the top 10% of, of all US VC performance. He's raised more than $300 million as founder of his own startups. And he's a university professor on venture capital at one of California's oldest and largest universities, Chapman in Southern California. And he's a three-time author uh, with major publishers in six different languages. Thank you so much for joining us, Andrew. Nathan, great to see you. Great to be back again with you. Andrew, can you share with us a little bit of your journey? I'm excited to get into the topic more recently because I have a podcast. I have written books. I've had the experience of like foreign rights and, and all that. And I've done events and it kind of fits into my venture capital business. And so I'm an entrepreneur who is a VC, but I'm still an entrepreneur. And so it's exciting to learn from each other about how this space is evolving, you know, for, for the community that you're building around podcasts and that kind of thing. I mean, my quick journey, I mean, you read my bio already, sort of. I went, I got into technology early out of undergrad. I uh, had a couple venture back startups, you know, with some good, some bad outcomes, like an IPO on the NASDAQ, M&A, and some failures. So I've even gone through firing 150 people and putting a thing into bankruptcy and down rounds and all that. So I've seen, you know, good weather and bad weather on that side. You know, I've founded two VC funds from scratch and, you know, raised the money and completed a lot of investments. And you were kind enough to mention that the, our scoreboard is good. Uh, you know, I think most VCs probably return the money eventually. So it's like hard to lose your money investing in most VC funds because they're diversified and they know what they're doing, hopefully. The question is, were you better off putting it into government treasury bills or, you know, or the stock market or real estate in some part of the world? That's really popping. And, and is it, are you getting enough of a premium to justify what is typically a wait? We've actually innovated a way to return the fund faster by selling a little bit along the way and letting people invest more along the way, you know, outside of the fund. But that's sort of my journey. I mean, and I think more relevant to what we're talking about today is the books, the podcasts. I used to do a lot of blogging and I kind of, you know, don't do too much of it, but I do a little bit throughout the year. And I think it's an interesting topic. Uh, you, know, you know, as far as most VCs, I'm actually participating in a lot of this stuff. So I'm curious to talk to you about it. So you've talked about some highs and lows in your business journey. Tell us about your best high, the greatest grand slam home run you've ever hit. And what was the most important thing you learned from that? And then tell us about your worst failure. And, and what did you learn and take away the most important lesson from that? It's funny. I remember being at this offsite training thing for this company I worked for that was building fiber optic cable networks around the world at, at the very beginning of my career. And the guy was like, he was kind of spoon feeding us that book, Getting to Yes, and like negotiations training and stuff. And he asked the question, what do you seek the most in a characteristic of a customer? And I think I said, open and honesty and being willing to share information so I know what they want. So I know how to potentially negotiate a deal and please them. And my boss, who was running the whole globe around the world flying ticket guy, Rob Heller said, I like a customer who says yes. And, and, I, and I remember at the time thinking, that's a stupid thing to say. I mean, I'm coming up with a thoughtful answer that'll get us all, you know, learn from each other. And just getting to yes means nothing. And to answer your question, what's the high point? It's when someone says yes. It's when like you get somebody to say, I'm in for $50 million into the fund. And it's a yes. It's essentially closing a sales deal, really. And then the other, the other high is even somebody coming in with a really small check of 50 to 100K, but it's the head of co-pilot at Microsoft. Some tech person, we want to be able to tap into that brain and network. And then of course, I think any venture capitalist or entrepreneur will tell you 
the high point is when the exit comes and you sell or IPO one company that returns the entire fund three times. And then it happens again and lightning starts to strike multiple places. And I think there's a little element of luck in this. And you can try to neutralize luck or the, the need for luck with diversification and double down in your winners and sell a bit early and do a lot of favors for other people is the real truth on how to generate your own luck. But um, those business events, a little bit like my old boss saying, I like to hear the word yes. You know, those are, those are the high points. You know, low points are, you know, it's a bit scary when you see a big investment go south or sideways or find out that there's criminal activity somewhere or, holy cow, the level of fraud here is sophisticated. <laughs> you know, th 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 those are low points. Um, I think for some people, if you got to get used to hearing no a lot. So have a high pain threshold for rejection. You know, keep picking yourself up and getting in excited and enthusiastic about what you're talking about. Because even when we're raising money for a fund, we get a lot of no's for a lot of different reasons. Ooh, China's going to annex Taiwan. That's our reason for no. And it hasn't even happened yet. All right. So that failure that you talked about, what's the most important takeaway you took from that? How do you see the world differently or do business differently? because of that failure? I guess it is plan for the worst at all times. Like if you think you're Columbus and you're gonna sail across the ocean and you have a sense of how many days of water and food and supplies you need, more than double that, you know, and, and even have other contingency plans. Maybe you have to throw people off the boat to make sure that this water gets us there. And, you know, kind of plan for the worst. Um, throwing people off the boat sounds really horrible, in the world of Silicon Valley, if you've hired extremely talented people, they're extremely marketable, marketable. And you can even make some introductions and they might be loving to get out of a dot sinking ship and into an ascending ship that's taken off like a rocket. Um, so I think, I think what I learned there was um, don't be naive and listen to people saying, hey, we're going to wire the money on Monday. Go off and have a great Christmas holiday break, and we're going to wire the money as soon as you get back in January. And then you get back in January and that guy all of a sudden backs out for ghosting you and not even talking to you or gives you some big reason that's beyond anyone's control. And so I think the biggest lesson for the failures is um, almost plan for failure and make sure you don't. The way I look at it is I, I look at what keeps me up at night. I look at the things that are the biggest risks that could go wrong, that could tank us and cause my failure. And then I get up and work and do everything I can to minimize the risks of those elements. Take a risk, but a measured risk and say, I'm going to yeah. take a risk. And, you know, like I'm going to spend money to fly to Saudi Arabia. I'm going to pitch my deal to this family. It's, I don't know about this introducer guy. Maybe he's not real. Maybe he's not real. But this is the total cost of the plane ticket, the trip, the everything and the time and distraction. If this goes to zero, am I willing to take that risk, even if it goes to zero? And so you're basically saying, I can, that my ship can get hit with this torpedo and it will not sink me. And so it's like a measured risk. And That's even right. mentally, you know, you tell your spouse before you even do it and say, hey, we're going to spend, you know, a couple million dollars on this Saudi thing and it's probably going to fail. But if it hits, it'll be generational wealth. You run a podcast and, and you get a lot of traffic, especially from LinkedIn as you, as you publish, repost this content um, that, that you're creating. Can you tell me a little bit more about your journey to create the podcast and, and maybe even specifically, what are, what are some of the benefits, the best benefits that you've seen as a VC running a podcast? Yeah, well, so I think of the podcast a little bit analogous to um, me behaving in meetings and phone calls and talking to my portfolio companies that I've invested in, to my partners within the fund, to young people that were growing up here and to other VCs and even buyers and lawyers and everybody involved in these companies developing to self-actualize, keep getting funded, not run out of money and ultimately crystallize some sort of 
exit with M and A IPO PE, you know, secondary. Um, that that um, people were asking me or, or telling me you should write a book. And this is going back decades. So people were telling me you should write a book because this is valuable stuff that that is being discussed here. That's coming out of you. Why don't you write a book? And it started off with me telling the story of what some other entrepreneur did in the same situation that you're in now. So like I'm in a meeting with somebody and I said, this happened to somebody else I know. This is how they got through it. And so the book kind of was needed to get born like a baby and just be birthed and come out. It wasn't so much I'm like, oh yeah, these guys write a book. I should write a vanity book and beat my chest like Tarzan about how great I am. So like that's kind of what happened with book one. And then I went through a publishing experience with McGraw-Hill and McGraw Hill screwed up the Japanese, you know, uh, you know, translate or you know, you know, we had like Nikkei wanted to publish it because I have LP investors in my fund from Japan, so they were hooking me up in Tokyo. And then McGraw Hill screwed that up, so that was a big learning. And then going through all those experiences, I then started to see benefits come from writing books. And at the time, I was blogging a bit. Blogging was kind of bigger than it is now. And people still read blogs, and I, and I do blog a little bit, but I kind of think we are training the younger generation to screw up their neurons, and all they can do is watch TikTok and Google Shorts. And so podcasts is a different thing. But at the same time, we were talking privately that people like you and me like to go deep into a topic that's not a TikTok short. And so the podcast uh, medium is a nice way to get really deep. I mean, Joe Rogan kind of does the crazy like three hour episode with Quentin Tarantino. And where else are you going to get to know Quentin Tarantino? Like you spent a weekend with him in the South of France than the podcast. So all these things sort of evolved. It kind of went from books to uh, the blogging to let's start essentially blogging in video and audio. Um, and the benefits, I mean, so the short answer to your question is, the main moving parts that impact my business are someone investing in our VC fund. And that's a wide group from small checks from little angel investors to bigger checks from super rich people to family offices that have so much money that they're paying people on a team to large corporations, endowments, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, insurance companies, it goes on. So the combination of books, blogging, LinkedIn, real world events in person. And the podcast is just another spoke and like what's becoming a wheel to spin like a Disney wheel that brings, you know, LP capital into our fund. And the other side of the business is finding startups to invest in. So maybe someone listens to this podcast that we're recording now, and then they will contact me to fund them. And we will end up investing in a company that has a multi-billion dollar exit outcome. And so, you know, a lot of deal flow comes to us from these different mediums that we're creating content in, you know, from the events to the podcast, to the books, to the blogging. Um, and you could say there's some reputational stuff that, you know, if you're trying to suck value out of the universe at all times, you're probably not even going to survive. If you take a view of, I spend some time you know, doing favors for other people, those favors may pay off down the line. So there's an element of that to the time that's allocated here. Okay. So I love this direction, this analogy you've given of this wheel and spoke model. Um, can you, can you expand on that a little bit more? You referred to Disney, maybe start off by explaining how Disney does it and then, you know, how, how a, a business can do that with books and and uh, podcasts and, and these other things you've mentioned. Yeah, and I also think that there's an opportunity clearly for individuals that are not even raising angel funding or venture funding to start off with some element of content creation and get sponsors, you know, to, you know, make more money doing this than they did working at the New York Times or whatever. And they have the independence of a, you know, like the Uber driver, but they could be in Thailand one day and skiing and some amazing place the next day in the Andes, right? Yep. Um, so I think it's worth thinking about that. So the Disney, the Disney spoke and wheel model 
is like a well doc. If you get an MBA, you'll be forced to read a Harvard Business School case on this kind of stuff. And there's others that have tried to replicate it, but Disney's the most famous. So Disney was, you know, Walt Disney himself like made Mickey Mouse as content, right? And so you've got the cartoon and even kind of like the comic strip. But, you know, the cartoon itself is like one form of content. So that's one spoke. And you could say all the movies, even down to they've acquired Star Wars, probably killed it, but, you know, it's not totally dead yet. So you have these movies that are like, you know, Snow White or whatever, and, 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 and the dwarfs. And then they make an amusement park where you physically go there, like it's Great Adventure with a roller coaster, and you can get out of the Snow White ride or, you know, what the Jungle River ride or whatever that stuff is. And so going, bringing your family to the ride reinforces the interest in them buying what was the DVD, that the evil company of Disney would only make the DVD available between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And they promise you're not going to get it for the next four years when your little princess daughter is too old to give a damn other than she hates you for not having <laughs> bought her the princess whatever thing. So the, the, the amusement park absolutely reinforces the DVD sales or, you know, pay, pay to rent it on Amazon now is where we are now with that. And um, so content drives that. And then there's the merchandise that um, the merchandise gets you to buy this little Yoda hoodie. And now the little kid identifies that he's wearing Yoda every day. So he wants to go to the Universal Star Wars fun park in Orlando. And he's pumped to be watching the movies and paying money for it. And so these different spokes of like merchandise, the, the movies, the content, the little TV offshoot, you know, and the amusement park ride creates a wheel that starts to roll with thunderous momentum that is a monster that cannot be stopped. And if one, and the, you know, they have cruises, it, it, you know, if you really, you know, if you really know Disney, you're probably seeing there's a whole lot of stuff that they've got on top of that than the ones I've mentioned. And so I think in this world, an individual can potentially start with a side hustle and quit their job and start writing books, getting online courses for the book, maybe, you know, doing real world events, bringing a community together, and then podcasting with members of the community and be building something that people like that's valuable to a certain constituency. And they begin to get a Disney hub spoke wheel thing going. And it maybe be gets, it becomes bigger than one individual person. And it turns into a company that's you know, the livelihood for many people. Yeah. And I see how they build momentum upon each other, right? You have the podcast and because you've invited guests on your podcast, they invite you on their podcast. And because you become an expert on this, you create a book on it. And because you've got a book and a podcast and you're on shows, you get invited to speak at trade shows, right? It's this momentum that just builds off. Yeah, of I mean, that. everyone's business is different, but like for me, I had a book on Masters of Corporate Venture Capital where Rural Sood is the co-founder of Microsoft Ventures. He's like the case study in that book. But then he left Microsoft, started a company, and I funded it. And then we sold it and made a lot of money together. And I actually lost contact with anyone at Microsoft Ventures. I think I met some younger people there, but then they rebranded as M12. And then some PR person cold emailed me asking if the, the new head of Microsoft Ventures, now M12, could be on the podcast. And he's like a super cool guy on LinkedIn. And I met him through the podcast. And we have this shared experience that we recorded an episode together. We got to know each other. We spoke privately, of course, and we're already sharing deals. And he's looking at making investments into my existing portfolio companies. So we don't just throw the money blindly and pray that this Vegas investment we've placed a bet on is going to succeed by introducing them to M12, Microsoft, the, if they invest and they put that onto the Microsoft platform, that's like much bigger than Disney if you're a tech company. So, you know, so, so I, I see real value in that. In fact, we were talking privately, we, we made an investment into a company that could be relevant to a lot of your listeners and viewers, which is daily.ai. So it's like, I have a daily newsletter that comes out every day or even once a month or once a year, dot AI. And that's a tech company that is enabling any company or individual to create a newsletter that'll create content. So somebody could say, I want to have a podcast that's about podcasting. 
and you can use daily.ai and explain exactly what you want the newsletter to do. And it'll run out automatically. It'll automatically just go out as a machine, grab all the new releases on who's been funded in the podcast world, what products are good on it, blogs about, you know, ticks and chips, tips and tricks or something about this. And it'll put it together with AI and then you approve it or make some changes and it goes out. And then the real kicker comes in with the feedback loop. It's measuring the hell out of every response to everything. And it starts understanding the individual out there and it can send a different newsletter to this person and a different newsletter to that person. And so the open rates, the open rates are like over 50% where the, you know, the open rates of the industry is like far, far, far lower. So to kind of to be doing it without that kind of technology is a bit crazy, but who has time to write a newsletter about every single venture deal that's happening in Southern California or the Boston area or something? So it's kind of interesting to embed some of these tech stack things, you know, into your hub and spoke thing and one feeds off another. Now, if you're, if you're selling an online course to the book that you've written, then that newsletter could be driving sales to that book or getting people to download your app. I love it. The technology can definitely uh, facilitate that hub, hub and spoke or wheel and spoke, whatever we call it, model. Uh, much better than we could historically do. Do you, do you think businesses that go this direction that have some other product or service, they may be a software company, they may be selling pergolas and pavilions for backyards, right? But, but they adopt these things you're talking about, the books and the podcasts and speaking, and they build audiences and followings. Do you think that can increase value of a, where, where podcasting is not the core of the business, but it's the marketing strategy of a business that has a different focus. Look at Mr. Beast. Um, I don't know the numbers all that well, but um, you know, he makes these videos. He's spending real money with a team of hundreds of employees to make them now. And he was living off of his little pittance of revenue share that YouTube, Google pays him while they keep almost all the value for themselves, doing very little other than being the platform. And then he introduced like chocolate bars. Right. And I heard that in the first year of introducing a Mr. Beast chocolate bar, that his sales are over like $250 million now. And he owns a hundred percent of that chocolate bar. We've invested in companies like, like daily harvest is now valued at over a billion dollars and super coffee is valued at over half a billion dollars. But those companies spent a lot of venture capital funding to build those brands and get there. So like, you know, Mr. Beast, you know, introducing a little merchandise or, yeah. you know, an actual product to a community that, that, that fits, you know, with it is quite interesting. Okay. And, you know, I, I just think that it's very noisy out there. There's a lot of like, you know, so I almost think like the Viet Cong will win the Vietnam conflict and the American army will lose it. And in this scenario, it's the venture back startup that's the American army getting slaughtered right. by all these people just like in the trees and in, you know, in civilian clothes that I think I see a big opportunity for these individual people to say, yeah, I was working at the New York Times and then getting paid 150K a year, which you could barely have a child and survive in New York City on that salary. And then I switch over to moving to jamaica or bali and i'm now writing all my stuff on a pay to subscription platform and i'm actually making more money in subscriptions and i finally mon monetizing my worthless twitter following or my enormous following i have on linkedin you know and so i think for that individual you know they may not need to raise outside funding and that's a huge uptick yeah. in life improvement and i'll bet you they feel better then going to the office and getting a bullocking and saying, I want you to write an article every week that sounds like sex in the city. And that's not what they want to write about. Okay. So you're saying that maybe one of the advantages of podcasting is they don't need to go raise VC funding. Maybe they can build it from scratch and build a following and build an audience that they own hundred percent, create a lifestyle business that allows them to have the freedom, you know, to, to experience life on their terms. Um, 
instead of creating the the big, huge corporate Joe Rogan podcast. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it, it's it's not a good idea to compare yourself to like, hey, invest in my startup because we're just like YouTube and YouTube just got acquired for 1.6 billion or whatever it was. Well, now that there's YouTube, that's a Mack truck that your ant sized company is going to get run over by. So yeah. we're not investing in your company and it's a bad to compare yourself to that or saying, oh, I want super voting rights like Mark Zuckerberg. I'm like, well, if your company took off on Harvard campus the way his did and spread to all the, par- all the other schools and spread to all the parents, then yes, you can have your super voting rights, but it's not a good idea to compare yourself to that. I think that Spotify was trying to really make a product extension from music only into the podcasting space and into the whole content world. And what was the future of television over the top broadcasting and everyone's a citizen journalist and every, every individual's a broadcaster in this world. And so it made sense for them to pay a hundred million and they could algorithm algorithmically position it for, they would get over a million in cash back in a relatively short period of time. So Joe got, um, you know, he moved to Austin, Texas from California to not pay tax on that, deferred the transaction until his lawyer said, you're fully in the clear to not pay any tax in this hundred million. But that's pretty cool that he started a company and sold it for a hundred million and he owns his cake, his cake and can eat it too. Yeah. Because he keeps all the um, merchandise and sponsorships that go into it. And then he's got a clean hundy for life. So I would say that in entrepreneurship, and I've been on all sides of the table, if you can build a business and not have to raise capital and sell part of your little pizza pie. So when your hundred million comes, you get all 100 million and you don't have to give 30 million to this VC and 40 million to that. And, and then after they've been paid back, you get your percentage or something. It's a wonderful thing to build a business that can be scaled on the retained earnings and profits that you're generating. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I would, I would think that, so that's the good news. The other kind of bad news in this is that most VCs want to invest in a company that has, you know, a lot, of, first of all, so many of them are just B2B SaaS, software as a service. So they want software that is being, you know, sold to another company. And, and then, and then those, there's a lot that are into consumer, fine, but is your business going to be big enough? And is it unique? If it's not, you know, is it unique? And so it starts looking like a brand. Most VCs are not going to invest in a startup that's going to make blue jeans and, and have, and build a unique brand in the blue jeans fashion industry or a movie or television media company where they're saying, we want to make game of thrones but on a low budget. Most tech VCs are not going to invest in that media company. And if you're a newspaper or hub and spoke of the podcast and the events and the stuff, they're typically not going to invest in it. They'd rather invest in the guys making the picks and shovels being sold to the opportunistic gold miners that go running off to San Francisco for the gold rush. Right. But there could also be the platform play that, if you're the company that all the journalists were making 150K working for the New York Times, now they're making 750K selling subscriptions through some Shopify business in a box. I think there's an opportunity for someone to offer. We have the full tech stack of the daily AI newsletter. We've got the tech stack for how to make sure with one click you're on Amazon and not just siloed on Spotify. We figured it all out. All you have to do is you be you and we will be successful together. I think there's probably some big opportunities for somebody to be venture backed and start pulling together a magic tech stack and it gets some kind of crowdfunding, you know, momentum that say, you know, cause you, you know, most people record their podcast, post it to Spotify and YouTube and, you know, or get it onto iTunes, whatever platform you're using. And get very little view, views and plays. So I think there's an and opportunity the technologies for some... aren't integrated and they're expensive. And so that's actually what we've tried to do with Pot Up. We've we've uh, built a platform. We have 35 different technologies we brought together and uh, to help you create, grow, and monetize your podcast. And we've raised more than four million dollars so far. And nice. I'm I'm, I'm uh, sure there's lots of other players trying to do that as well. But 
that opportunity you describe is exactly what we're chasing. Well, that's fantastic. And I think that if, if someone's going for that kind of more, I am the Joe Rogan content and it'll die with me sort of thing, you might be able to attract angel investors that are, you know, a rich person who made their money as a partner at Bain or something that likes you or met you. And you may be able to structure an investment that says, look, if I can raise $500,000, I can afford to pay for marketing and agencies and throw some money on, on YouTube and throw some money at Spotify or whatever. And that um, once we're generating these revenues from sponsorships or the events or whatever it is, I'll pay you your money back. And then in perpetuity, you own a slice of the profits. And yeah. here's, here's the transparency I commit to with my integrity that you can log into my books and see each sponsorship showing up and blah, blah, blah. So I think that it may not be venture backable for that lifestyle person who's not doing a platform like Pot Up, but um, they might be able to find some people in their network or network to some angels that provide some funding where they say, look, I don't mind throwing $50,000 or $100,000 or two fifty k into this individual. They already have amazing, you know, set of content creation that they have. And I'll get my two fifty k back. And then I get a steady revenue stream that over the next 10 years looks like a minimum of four or five X my investment into the company. And I'm happy to support this person. It might even be someone that's you know, you've known since they were a child and now they're getting their own little miniature Mr. Beast traction. So I think it's possible to raise money from individuals for your deal, even if Sequoia and Kleiner Perkins are not beating a path down to your door. Yeah, that's what we've to done. Fu we, to fund we've raised $4 million, but not, we haven't received any VC funding. It's all been, almost all of it is from successful CEOs that have made money and, and, uh, and they're investing individually. That, that's the vast majority of what we've well, received. That's great. Well, it, it, and that's impressive. Four million from angel investors is, sounds like a lot of meetings, a lot of calls. That's awesome. <laughs> it's, Good for it's you. It's consumed a lot of my life. What is the greatest secret of success for your Fireside with the VC podcast? Well, first of all, uh, it's very generous of you to call it a great success. I think that we have, um, there's a lot of, interesting people and like important people that stay in touch with me. I, I think maybe one of the points of success is that, you know, you get to know someone like Mark Cuban and there's only so much we email each other back and forth or get on the phone ever. And by having the podcast out there, it kind of, it's like sending a Christmas card or something. They yeah. are sort of staying in touch with you a little bit. Or when you do meet them, they say, they're like laughing and they're, they're, they're demonstrating that I've been watching your stuff. And so maybe there's some value in that. Um, I don't know. I, I think that uh, this is not a very unique thing to say, but if you consistently have really good guests for what your niche area is, that's probably... Uh, you know, you're marching in the right direction that, that may be more important than yeah. all, all of the, you know, all of the tech stack for me, I'm kind of only doing podcasts with people that I want to have lunch with that I was going to have a call with anyway. Occasionally yeah. there's someone like there's a new head of M12 and I didn't know him. I knew the former person, but not the new one. And I said, Oh, great. Let's go do this little shared experience. It's a bit like my books. You know, when I put Pitch Johnson and Bill Draper, the first venture capital firm west of the Mississippi, and wrote about what it was like for them in the early days of Silicon Valley, I ended up in their dining rooms and their homes in Atherton with my wife and their wives getting to know each other. This never would have happened had we not had this shared experience, even if I might have met them, you know, in, in a very formal professional environment a few times, you know. You, you kind of had that shared experience of we'll always have Paris. We'll always have the book. And oh, by the way, it's in six languages now. How cool is that? Your ego, your reputation living on canonized thanks to me. You know, so that was a bit of a shared experience. To a smaller extent, it's kind of like that on podcasts. And you might be helping somebody 
by putting them on your podcast. So, you know, like I say this on my LinkedIn, if you spend 30% of your time doing favors for other people, asking for nothing in return, that means that you went from spending 100% of your time going to work every day, telling your family I'm working hard, daddy's working here, down to only 70%. So it's like you're taking 30% vacation time from your work, even on a busy Monday after, after the holiday break. Well, if you're doing 30% of your time doing favors for other people all the time, nonstop, every day, so if somebody asks you for something, instead of saying, oh, I'm too busy, you're like, oh, thank you, God. This will be my, help me with my quota of doing someone else a favor. That remaining 70% of your time, if you're bad at this, will probably be 2x more effective. Yeah. And you're trying to get someone on your podcast, but you did a favor to that guy. Well, all of a sudden, he's going to refer somebody really big to be on your podcast and boom, you are incapable of getting Bill Gates onto your podcast. And now you've got a Bill Gates episode. That'll be a game changer for you. So sure. the idea that you're 70%, 2x is so you're, you're, you're achieving 1.4x results compared to 1x results of not helping other people, you know, that, that's maybe a way of thinking about some of this. Andrew, thank you for sharing your time and wisdom with us today. If our audience enjoyed it like I did and they want to learn more about you and your products and services, what are the best ways for them to do that? Yeah, well, you can find me on LinkedIn. It says Andrew Romans or forward slash Romans, R-O-M-A-N-S. The other one is to email me directly, which is andrew at 7bc.vc. So that's number 7bc.vc is in venture capital. And if you're into podcasts and you want to hear a bunch of VCs blabbering on or entrepreneurs blabbering on with their VC, often my portfolio companies, but not always, you can find us at Fireside with a VC. Love it. And again, thanks for the value you shared with us today. I really enjoyed Nathan, it. Thank you. Great to see you. Here are my key takeaways from this episode. Number one, get comfortable with hearing no a lot. Keep picking yourself up with enthusiasm after rejection. Have a high pain threshold for rejection. Number two, plan for the worst possible outcomes in business. Don't be naive. Have contingency plans even for unlikely failures. Number three, closing sales and getting people to say yes can be major high points in business. Number four, consistently having great guests is key to a successful podcast. Provide value to them so they return. Number five, spend 30% of your time doing favors for others without expecting anything in return. This can pay huge dividends later. And finally, number six, use a hub and spoke model like Disney to create momentum across books, podcasts, events, etc. Let them reinforce each other. If you're looking for a great all-in-one podcasting platform with more than 35 integrated modules, you can get a free trial at podup.com. Thanks for joining us for this episode. I wish you success as you work to turn your passion into profit through podcast monetization.